was on their minds as they came to worship as they were making their ascent up to Jerusalem. And this morning as we come to worship, I hope that the Lord is on your mind. If we were in the sanctuary when we come into the presence of the Lord and extend this call to worship, people would stand and literally honor the Lord, respect the Lord. Some people might even stand and lift their hands to the Lord and just tell God thank you this morning for letting us come together one more time. So right where you are, some of you are sitting out uh, in your chairs and some are sitting in your cars, but we're coming before the presence of our great God, our King, the Holy One, who's worthy to be worshiped. So those of you who are sitting, if you don't mind just standing and lifting your voices to the Lord and praise unto the Lord. Those of you in your cars, if you want to just stand in reverence and all of the Lord to, to just worship God, just to tell God thank you, to invoke his presence and invite him in. Just say to the Lord, Lord, we love you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We, we praise you. We adore you, God. Uh, hallelujah. We, we just bless your name. I lift my hands to you in submission and praise. Hallelujah. Oh, just worship God where you are. Just feel his presence. I know we feel the sun and it it glitters and gleam upon us in depth of this morning, but you ought to feel the presence of the Lord to be free this morning and to just worship, worship the Lord. Just take a moment, just give God thanks this morning for who he is, worthy is the Lord, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised from the rising of this sun to the going down of the same He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, Lord, we bless your name. Father, we bless your name. We worship you in this place. Lord, release your power. Let your spirit flow all through this audience this morning, God. For you to reign supremely. apart from Christ that we are not worthy but through the blood of the Lamb of God we are made worthy. Thank you for keeping us throughout another week God. Thank you for protecting us from things that could have happened in our lives. Lord you kept us. Lord you blessed us. Lord you're good to us. And we just want to come this morning and to praise you to worship you, God, to declare in this place that there's none like you, God. Nobody can do what you do. Hallelujah. All of the glory belongs to you. We humbly submit ourselves to your lordship, to your sovereignty right now. Breathe fresh on your people. Your way in this place. For it is in the marvelous, matchless name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All over this place. Give God some glory. Give God some glory. He is worthy today to be praised. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, sir. God is worthy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming this morning to the people of God. Thank you. For just pressing your way to be out early. I just declare again, God is good. Those songs of ascent showed us the minds of the people, the hearts of the people, as they came to worship. And 
I pray that our hearts and minds are in the right place on today. Uh, I thank you all for joining us on the call on Thursday. Well, let me first of all thank you for joining us on the call on Wednesday for our Bible study sessions. And uh, <clears throat> I thank you for joining us in reaching out to help to try to restore someone this week. The Lord is going to honor your efforts. You know, what we've been doing in our Bible study series for the past month or so is teaching on avoiding relapsing. And there comes a place, a point when we talk that we need to go and put in practice what we taught. And so as you join us on Wednesday and throughout this week, we'll be working to put the word of God in practice. As the spirit of God leads you to minister to those who have been asked to minister to follow the Lord because God is always right. Secondly, I want to thank you for joining us in the conference on Thursday and the words that some of you shared and some have called and made contact since then. I want you to know that I've been encouraged by your words. Thank you for your commitment to the work of ministry. Thank you for your commitment to the Lord. This morning, <clears throat> I want to uh, invite our attention to uh, the second book of Chronicles, Second Chronicles, uh, chapter number 20, verses 1 through 4, uh, a familiar passage. And, and this morning, I, I want you to just, I want you to listen as uh, the Lord uh, teaches us and help us to understand some things from Second Chronicles, chapter number 20, verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading these verses from the New King James Version. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. It happened after that that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon and others with them beside the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is come against you from beyond the sea, from Syria. And they are in Hazazon Tamar. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and to proclaim a fast throughout of all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. I want to just talk this morning from the thought dealing with more than we can handle. Dealing with more than we can handle. Most of us have heard the statement or perhaps made the statement that says God will not put more on us than we can bear. However, if we search scripture, I don't think that we can find this statement implied anywhere in the Bible. We have interpreted 1 Corinthians 10, 13 to mean that God would put no more on us than we can bear. How many of y'all first of all heard that statement, God won't put any more on you than you can bear? We've heard this statement, but is this statement Bible? Sometimes when we see people going through difficult times, we turn to them and we say to them, the Bible says God will not put no more on us than we can bear. <clears throat> and what we've done, we've taken 1 Corinthians 10, 13 to simply mean that, but that is not what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 means. Look at what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. 
But with the temptation would also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now it's important for us to look critically at 1 Corinthians 10, 13 to understand what it says and understand what it does not imply. First of all, this passage, it deals with temptation. It does not deal with burdens and the circumstances of life. You see, and, and as we look at this, this passage, again, write this down, this passage is strictly, first of all, or more importantly, it deals with temptation. And, and it's an important to understand that temptation is not of God. God tests us, but God does not tempt us. Satan tempts us, but Satan does not test us. Look at what the Bible says in James 1.13. The Bible says there, let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. You see, God is not the tempter. Satan is the tempter. And when we imply that 1 Corinthians 10.13 mean that God is putting something on us, even temptation, then we got it all wrong. Because God cannot tempt us with evil, neither does he tempt any man. The Bible makes it clear that Satan is the tempter, not God. In Matthew chapter 4, Matthew identifies Satan as the tempter. Look at what happened after Jesus' baptism in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, then, the, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fast 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Verse 3, now when the tempter, Satan, came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now again, look at the passages in Matthew chapter 4. The Spirit of God led Jesus up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, now Jesus, as one writer said, being led of the Spirit into the wilderness, there he was to be tested. He was simply led by the Spirit to, de to, de to demonstrate the strength of his character and the depth of his devotion. The English word here for tempted in Matthews 4 and 1 is the Greek word parazo. And this word means to test. So let's go back again and understand the passage in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 1. The Bible literally teaches us that the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to test the strength of his character and the depth of his devotion. In other words, the Spirit of God led Jesus there to prove his devotion because the Spirit of God understood that Jesus would stand when Satan came against him. And so the tempter came to Jesus and he tried to entice him to put his humanity above his devotion to the Father's will. And so, so when we look at this passage in Matthew chapter 4, and verses 1 through 3 or 1 through 4, we need to understand that it was not God sending Jesus up, up into the wilderness so he could fail, but he sent Jesus into the wilderness so Jesus can prove some things. And God, he does try us. God, he does test us, but God does not tempt us. So the first thing we need to understand that in, first, in, in the passage where, where we dealt with in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we need to understand this passage is dealing primarily with temptation. Secondly, we need to understand that 1 Corinthians 10, 13 shows us that God makes a way of escape when we are tempted by Satan. In other words, when temptation comes, God, he makes a way out for all of us. You see, God destroyed the power of sin. 
He gave us victory over the power of sin. Sin does not have power over us. The same God who destroyed the power of sin, he did not destroy the presence of sin. Okay, the power of sin is destroyed. We have the ability to resist temptation. But the presence of sin is in this world. God, God did not destroy the presence of sin. And because the presence of sin is in this world, then Satan, he tempts us. But when the temptation comes, God, he always makes a way of escape so we can bear the temptation or we can deal with the temptation regardless of what we experience. Whatever Satan throws at us, we can't make an excuse for giving in. Why? Because God has always and he always will make a way of escape. The problem is not that God hasn't made a way. The problem is when temptation comes, we don't look for the way of escape. When temptation comes, God has already made a way of escape. And then it shifts to us to take the way of escape. And so when we read this passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, first of all, it deals with temptation. Secondly, it shows us that God has made a way of escape. But then there's a third thing taught here in this passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And what it is taught is the faithfulness of our God. The Bible teaches us at times Satan throws all sorts of things at us. But during those times, we should understand and we should remind ourselves of the faithfulness of our God. God is always faithful to us. Even when we're going through difficult times, Satan throws everything at us. Satan, he's reaching, reaping havoc in our lives. It is in those times that God is still faithful to us. Do you understand today that sometimes when Satan desires to carry out things in our lives, God places limitations on Satan because God is faithful? You see, sometimes we can see what Satan has done, but what we can't see behind the scene is how God in his faithfulness places limitations on Satan so that Satan can't do to us everything that he wants to do to us. If you go back to the book of Job, then when you read in the book of Job, particularly in chapter number two, it is easy to con conclude that Satan would have killed Job if God had not placed some limitations on Satan. It's important to understand that even when we're going through things, God is faithful. Look at Job chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, and I want to drive this point home. And in verse number 4, the Bible said, And Satan asked the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yet all that a man has will he give for his life. He says, put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he would curse you to your face. J Satan was telling God, God said Job would do anything or man would do anything, you know, to save his life. When he gets to a place, he goes through too much. If you would just only put your hands on Job and begin to flick his body, touch his bone, touch his flesh. Satan said to God, Job would curse you to your face. Now, but look at verse 6. He, here is here's what the Lord said to Satan. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, but save his life. Oh, you, you need to look at this carefully now. And I'm driving some stuff home today that we need to understand because we got some things all wrong about some of the stuff we deal with in life and even when we're burdened in life. Look at what God <clears throat> Said, said to Satan, he said in verse 6, and the Lord said unto Satan, behold, he is in your hand. Okay, he says, Satan, you can go and you can, you can go and you can afflict Job. But he said, don't you take his life. Why would God tell Satan that? Because Satan understood that if I can't get Job to capitulate 
when I touch his body and afflict him, I might as well kill him. And God said to Satan, Satan, don't you take his life. And I'm glad today we have a faithful God that even when we're going through some things, he places limitations on Satan so Satan can't do everything he desires to do. Anybody here understand that if Satan could have killed you, he would have already killed you. But there were times that Satan wanted to take us out. And God said, no, no, no. You may do some stuff in his life or in her life, but don't you take their life. I thank my God. I thank my God. Because I could have been dead. And at times I should have been dead. But God was faithful and he showed mercy unto me. And I'm still here today to give praises unto the Lord. So in difficult times, our God, he's still faithful. Now, 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 though God would not allow us to be tempted... Beyond what we're able to bear, God does not keep us from dealing with circumstances that are more than we can handle. Okay. Okay. And I need to help somebody with that. You see, because I've been in situations where I've seen people in, 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 in times of grief, times of struggles, times of literally fighting for their lives and we tell them it's going to be all right god won't put no more on you than you can bear can i tell you this let me help you to understand this some of the stuff that we deal with god is not putting on us sometimes god he's blamed for stuff that he shouldn't be blamed for and i understand that a sovereign god an omniscient god he doesn't allow anything to happen in our lives that first does not go by him. But just because it goes by him, it doesn't mean God is causing it to happen. Go back and read again the book of Job. God was aware of what Satan was doing. God didn't stop Satan, but God didn't bring that on Job. Satan brought that on Job. And when we're going through situations in life, we tell people that God won't put no more on you than you can bear. You can see, let me ask you this. If we could handle all of life's issues without God, would we ever turn to God? If, if we were able to bear all of the circumstances, the burdens of life without God, would we ever turn to God for divine assistance? Now, you just think about it. It stands to reason. When you're dealing with stuff that you can handle, you'll handle that. But when you deal with stuff that you can't handle, you, you actually invite God to come in and help you because that's more than you can handle. As a matter of fact, sometimes God places us in situations that are more than we can handle. You see, God tells Moses to go down to Egypt to bring his children out of bondage. Now, now this couldn't be done by Moses alone. It could only be done by the help of God. God chose Gideon to take 300 men to go out into battle against the Midianites and to have victory over them. This could be done, but it only could be done by the help of God. God tells Joshua to march around the walls of Jericho. He gives specific instruction to march around the Jericho wall. Then he tells Joshua that the walls will come down. But notice, understand, to understand this clearly, this could only be done by the help of Almighty God. David declared that some things can only be handled, be achieved by the help of God. Look at what David said in Psalm 18 and verse number 29. David says, but by you I can run through a troop. By you I can leap over a wall. In other words, there's something that can only be done or some things can only be managed by the power of God Almighty. So sometimes there are things that are too much for us to handle. God does not always shield us from circumstances of life. 
that we can handle without him. Now, now again, now let me ask you this question. This, you listen carefully, and I want you to listen. If you could handle things without God, would you invite God? If we could handle all of our burden, our circumstances, our cares, our crises in life, how many of us would ever pray? You see, sometimes God allows us to deal with circumstances that we can't handle without him because it's only when we can't handle things without him that we invite God to come in to help us with what we cannot handle. Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah, they were facing a situation. And clearly, when you read this passage, you'll understand that this was too much for them to handle. A group of nations gathered against them. Jehoshaphat felt a sense of hopelessness without God. Now listen as Jehoshaphat prays in, in 2 Chronicles 20, verse number 12. Jehoshaphat said, our God, will you not judge them, talking about the nations who had come up against them. He says, but we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Neither do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Jehoshaphat realized he and the people of Judah that this thing was too big for them to handle. So Jehoshaphat go to the Lord and say, Lord, we have no power against this great multitude of people. You see, and I thought about this situation that Jehoshaphat found himself in, he and the people of Judah. I thought about situations that we deal with in life. Sometimes our crises come, and, and they come, and it seems as if they are relentless as the waves of the sea. If you've ever been to the ocean, you and watch the waves come in, you'll watch the waves, they come in in a systematic order. The waves come in one after another. Just as soon as one wave crashes against the shore, Another wave comes behind that and it crashes against the shore. Sometimes in life, we deal with circumstances, situations like that. Anybody, it looks like that at the time one wave crashes in your life. That wave has not hit the shore good. Another wave comes behind that and it just crashes in your life. And by the time you deal with that, by the time you turn around again, there, here, here comes something else, and it just crashes in your life. You find yourself being hit with one thing after another. As we've been in this global pandemic for quite a while, have you noticed this cycle of this COVID pandemic? Have, have you noticed how it, it, it has come in in waves? When, when it first started, this pandemic seemed to just been towering over us, and we were wondering how we're going to make it. Then after a while, the pandemic, it peaked, and it seemed as if we were entering into a period of calmness. And now we're being told that we need to brace ourselves because another wave is coming. It, it, it seems as if this pandemic, it is acting like the waves of the sea is coming in. We take one shot after another. And there are some people who are buckling beneath its pressures because they, they thought it was over and now it's coming all back again. It may not be the global pandemic, there are people today who are dealing with situations that just like the waves of the sea, they hit on every side. One situation after another, and you're wondering, what am I going to do? Sometimes things can become overwhelming. And really, if we're real with ourselves, some of us sitting here today, we, we're dealing with more than we can handle. We can't find the scripture that teaches us God would not allow us to deal with more than we can bear. 
So, so, so we, we have to learn how to respond properly when we're dealing with more than we can handle. Too often we fail to respond in the right way. People, when they're dealing with more than they can handle, they turn to things and they turn to people for help instead of turning to the Lord. But the Bible teaches us that we are not to put our trust in things. We are not to put our trust in people. Rather, we are to put our trust in the Lord. So when we're dealing with more than we can handle, we got to know where to put our trust. Psalm 18, 118, verse 8, the Bible said it is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. You see, he tell, the Bible tells us that, that we, can't, we can't put our hope in mere man. We can't put our faith in what something that man merely comes up with. We must always put our trust, our faith in the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 31, Isaiah spoke against the Jews who were forming an allegiance with the Egyptians. The Assyrians were on the attack against the people of God. And, and instead of the Jews turning to God, the Jews turned to the Egyptians for help. They were aware of the Egyptians' wisdom, and they were aware of the Egyptians' might. So they turned to Egypt for help instead of turning to the Lord. And in Isaiah 31, Isaiah prophesied against them. Isaiah said, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and horsemen because they are very strong, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Well, what God was telling his people, I can do more for you than the Egyptians can do. I, I can protect you when they can't. As a matter of fact, if you continue to read in the prophecy of Isaiah, you'll understand that God was talking about how futile the wisdom of the Egyptian was, how futile the strength of the Egyptians were. God was telling the children of Israel that your faith ought to be in me. You ought to trust in me and not in man. Why? Because I'm wiser than they are. I'm mightier than they are. I can do for you what the Egyptians cannot do. You can't put your trust and faith in anything else. You got to put your trust in the Lord. When Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah were dealing with more than they can handle, they did three things. First of all, they looked to the Lord. Look, look at verses 3 and 4. The Bible said, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask him for help. From, from all the cities of Judah, the people came to seek the Lord. Whenever we deal with more than we can handle, we got to look to God. And, and, and let me say today, we, 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 we are in a crisis right now. And what we're experiencing, it is more than we can handle. We, we got to look to the Lord. And, and I wish I really had some time to, to deal with what's taking place in the body of Christ. We're going to have a lot of folk dying because there are Christians who don't know how to rightly divide the word of God. And you see, when we have more than we can handle, this COVID crisis is more than we can handle. But we got to learn how to look to the Lord. That's what Jehoshaphat did. He turned to God. He said unto the Lord, Lord, we need your help. So the second thing that they did, they lift their situation up to the Lord. It's one thing to look to God, but it's another thing to turn some stuff over to the Lord. Look at what they said here in the same chapter. They said, for we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you, God. We just giving you this thing. This, this situation that's too big for us, we place it in your hand. And when you got more than you can handle, you got to turn to God. You got to give this situation over to the Lord. You got to let it go and say, God, there's nothing else I can do with it, but I trust you to see me through. 
there's some things technically or, or, or simply, my brothers, we can't fix. There are some things that we just can't handle. And, 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 and I praise God for all of the strides that have been made through medical technology. There's some stuff that we just can't handle. And even with the strides made through medical technology, those strides have been only made by the power of God. We got to lift everything up to the Lord. The final thing that they that they did, they they looked to the Lord. They lift their situation up to the Lord. But then finally, they let the Lord handle it. And sometimes our problem comes in when when we the problem comes in when we don't know how to let God handle it. Have you ever been to a place in life when you just couldn't do anything with what you had? Have you ever been in a place in life where if God didn't do it, it wouldn't get done? M maybe, maybe you haven't, but I have. I've been in places where there's some things that I just couldn't handle. I did everything I know how to do, and I had to just give it over to God. When Jehoshaphat and the people that come turned to the Lord and they decided to let God handle it, they, when they were going out against this formidable host that had come up against them, notice what they did not do. They didn't prepare to fight, they prepared to praise. You need to read this chapter all the way through because on the day when they should have been going out to battle, what Jehoshaphat did is he lined up the praises first. Why? Because God told him, Jehoshaphat, you can literally set this out. You don't have to fight. Why? Because I'm going to fight your battle. You can't handle this. But if you would just own that, get ready to give me some praise and let me handle what you can't handle. I'll fight the battle for you. So on the day that they went out to meet this formidable army, the people began to praise God. They had decided that we're going to release everything. We're giving it over to God. We can't do anything about what we're about to deal with, but God can. And what I want to tell you today is that you got some stuff going on in your life that's too big for you to handle, but I declare it's just right for God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You see, my brothers and sisters, there's some stuff that God would allow to happen. Not that God brings it on you. There's some stuff God would allow to ha happen that you just can't handle. I mean, you need to look at your life. And I understand that we've been taught this all of our lives, but we've been taught wrong. We've been taught wrong. The Bible doesn't tell us God won't let us deal with more than we can handle. But the Bible does tell us that God, he's faithful to us. And when we got stuff that's too big for us, we can invite God to come in. We can humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, do it for us. We need you, God. We need you to handle because this thing is too big. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in that place. Anybody have seen God do some stuff that only God can do? Let me say to you this then. If, if you dealt with some stuff that God had to do that only he can do, you were dealing with something that you couldn't handle. Let me read a passage to you and I'm finished about, about what Paul said. In 2 Corinthians 1 and 8, Paul said, he says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our troubles which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure. He, and he goes on to say, above strength. So we despair of our life. What was Paul saying? Paul said that we were dealing with so many troubles in life they were beyond measure. We, we couldn't even measure the depth of what we were dealing with. And Paul said, not only that, he said, but it was above our strength. What was Paul saying? Paul said, we had some stuff that we just couldn't handle. Paul was saying that this is too big for us. Talking about the apostle Paul. Paul said, we couldn't handle this. But then, look at what he said in verse number 9. Paul said, yes, we have a death sentence, a sentence of death in our lives. But we should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raised Jesus from the dead. What are you saying, Paul? Paul 
is saying when you're dealing with more than you can handle, you got to turn it over to God. And when you turn it over to God, God knows how to handle it. God knows how to fix it. God can get you out of stuff. You can't get yourself out of. God can open doors that you can't open. God can make a way that you can't make it. God will do it when we can't do it for ourselves. I tell you, my brothers and sisters, I don't like being in a place when I'm dealing with stuff that I can't handle. But every time I'm in this place, I'm looking to God. Why? Because God, he said that I'll be with you. God, he be with us. God, he'll see us through. So listen, if you're dealing with more you can handle, I want to tell you to stand still today. Sometimes you'll be in a place and God said, don't you move. You can't do anything about it. You just stand still. The children of Israel at the bank of the Red Sea, they had to stand still and see the salvation of God. They couldn't do anything about it, but God was on the scene. Sometimes you got to stand still. And then while you're standing still, you got to stand in faith. You got to stand there and say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to do it somehow. Anybody in that place of faith where you say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you got to do something. I've done everything I know how to do, but God, you got to do something for me. You stand in that place of faith. But then I want to tell you today, you stand in that place of humility. Jehoshaphat humbled himself before the Lord. And he stood in that place of humility. Sometimes you just got to be still. You got to stand firm in faith. But you got to stand in the place of humility. And I like back humbling myself under God's mighty hand. Because I tell you, God, he will come through in due time. God, he will lift you up in due time. God will show himself strong at the right moment in time. Yeah, we deal with more than we can handle, church. Some of you, as you sat there and you gazing up here at me, if you look over there, you see those braces against the wall. Man, that's more than we can handle. And I tell you, if you have not prayed and that God, Lord, help us. It's a good time to pray and that God to help us right now. Why? Because when we invite God to come in, when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, God can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. God knows how to handle everything. Sometimes it's too big for us, but it's just right for God. We're dealing with more than we can handle. Some of your parents, you are concerned, I know, because you're going into a school. Some of you administrators, y'all going into a school where, God help me to stay out of this. Going into a school where there are some things that could be done to, to help make a safer environment for our staff and our children, but people with authority, they, they say that we can't enact certain practices that make common sense. Yes, yes. We have our children. They got to go into these classrooms. And there are things in there that we can't handle, but I tell you, God can go with them where we can't go. In a few days, I got grandchildren who will be going off to school because the virtual learning option in so many ways have been taken off the table. And am I concerned about them? Yes, I am. Are you concerned about your children, your grandchildren, nieces and nephews, and those little ones we got to send off into places? Can we go there? Can we change the environment? Can we keep them safe? Uh, no, we can't, we can't walk them down the aisle. We can't tell them, don't touch this, don't go over there. But I tell you, we can ask God to go where we can't go. Why? Because there are things that we, we just can't handle. But I tell you, God, he can... He can see us through. And in a moment, I want us to bring these little children, whatever you feel like the Spirit of God. I want us to pray for these children. But, but some of you are in environments where you can't handle what's going on. And you've been kept by the power of God. It's been too much for you. But God has seen you through. 
Listen, I wish I had time to talk about some other stuff today, but I want you to understand this message. God may not allow you to be exempted from more than you can bear, but when the load gets too heavy for you, God will lift that load off of you. God, he'll carry your burden. God, he will make a way somehow. God will do it for you. God will do it for you. Anybody want to give it to the Lord this morning? Time of prayer. You want to give it to God this morning. What is it that's more than you can handle? Listen, people, I want you, I, I, I'm just not saying a message. I want somebody to be helped. Why do you think people commit suicide? Because they get to a place that's more than they can handle. And some of you sitting here today, I know you're saved and you're sanctified. But you thought about it. Why? Because you've been dealing with stuff that was too much for you to handle. And the only reason you didn't because God stepped in and God helped you. And if we don't learn that sometimes in life that there are things that happen that are more than we can handle, but we have a God who's faithful, we can give it to. If we don't, if we go down the road of hopelessness, we're throwing the towel. But as long as God is there, we can always believe he's going to come through. So this morning, I want to extend an invitation, first of all, to come to Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Sometimes our loads get more than we can bear. But Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and what I'll do for you, I'll give you some rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Come on to Jesus if you are saved. He'll save you today. Jesus is waiting. He's waiting on someone. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know what I'll do. Don't know where I'll be. This morning, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you're dealing with something that is more than you can handle. Do you want to bring it to the Lord this morning? If so, I want you to want you to come. Do y'all know that sometimes infirmities are more than we can handle? some things it literally almost killed me I was coming here still preaching the word of God because I know God is faithful I had to preach through storms preach through tears preached through situations that I almost went out of my mind. And yes, I, I, I have to say that I had come to a point that I had given up on life. You all didn't know the depths of my struggles. My children were little, were little and my wife knows I, I, called, I called my brother up one day and I told him I want you to teach my boys how to grow up and be men. I had given up on life. And what I didn't know is 
that every morning the same brother that I called and said that I need you to teach my sons how to grow up to be men he would walk outside of my house and just be praying <laughs> and when I was almost done when I was told that there was nothing that they could do to help me Guess what God did? Hallelujah. God handled what I couldn't handle. Every once in a while, I look back. So I understand the plight. I understand what it's like to deal with stuff that's too big for you. But I've seen the amazing grace of our God. understand that the Bible teaches the priesthood of believers. The Bible says the prayer of the righteous avail much. But I want you to understand God will hear you just like he hears me. I'm trying to help you to get ready for ministry because I'm trying to help you to get to a place where you trust God and you understand that God has no respect of a person. God, God will hear you just like he hears the next person. And sometimes we get in a place we feel like a certain person got to pray. They got to do it this way in order to be heard. That man cried out and he said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. God will hear you. And I'm just going to walk around and I'm just going to be praying. Because that's what I, I feel like I need to be doing. Just walk around praying. And while this brother leads this audible prayer, I'm going to be walking around praying. And I want you to pray today. I want you to cover your children in prayer. I want you to pray for the administrative staff. In Jesus' name. God, I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, brother. And pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you today, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. We've been through so much, but God is taking care of us.
say thank you today, God. God, you're greater than any circumstance in our lives. You're greater than any issues in our lives. You're greater than any infirmities in our lives. God, you have the power to heal, set free, and deliver. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will move by your spirit today. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will move by your power. Because God, we don't know what to do. God, we pray that you will have your way in this place. This is the place, God, that you have sanctified for your name's sake. This is the place that you are visited every day, every night, and all the times you are here. And God, we say thank you right now. God, as our children began to go back to school, God, we can't be there, but we know you are there. You are there even before they get there, God. And we pray, God, that you will be there with them. There are so many innocent children, God, that just don't know what to do. We pray today, God, that you will throw your arms of protection around them and protect them from the evil of this world and all hurt, harm, and danger. God, we pray in the name of Jesus. You will have your way, God. As they ride to school, God, via bus, via car, we pray for traveling grace. We pray, God, that you will give your angels charge to keep them in all of their way. We pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, you will protect the teachers. You will protect the principals. Protect the staff, God. We pray in the name of Jesus, God, that no guns will enter into the school. We pray in the name of Jesus, God, that no knives will enter into the school. We pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you will stay the hand of the enemy. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said that I have come.
Hey, God, we say, have your way. Bless us every day, God. For we need you, God. And we can't do anything apart from you. Again, all of our help. All of our help. All of our help comes from you. There are some things, God, that we want to stop doing. But, Lord, see what we can't stop it. But, Lord, we pray that you will move by your spirit. Move by your power. We pray that you will stop lying tongues. We pray that you will stop those things that God calls us not to go forward. And give your name praise and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, God, that you will have your way. There's some people who want to stop drinking, but they can't stop. There's some people who want to stop smoking, but they can't stop. There's some people that want to stop gambling, but they can't stop. But God, we know that you got all power. All you got to do is move by your power, God. And whatever we desire in our hearts, you will allow it to happen. And we can do what we cannot do. You can do what we cannot do. Lord, have your way. Heal the sick. Heal the sick today, God. Heal the sick today, God. Touch. Set free and deliver. Help us to be real today, God. In the name of Jesus, God. We love you. We thank you. We give your name praise. We give your name the glory. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. And one more thing, God. We ask you to forgive us sin. Forgive us for all of our sin. Create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. Cast us not from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from us. And we'll be so careful to give your name all the praise and all the glory. It is you, God, that do it the work. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace, my father's children. The grace of God, the blessings of God, the favor of God rest upon your life. Now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and present us forth before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and